Okay, so um, today we're going to do a little bit of a review of mechanical properties with an eye toward uh, pulling together a few concepts um, that are definitely useful. Um, and so we're going to talk about a few things that you've, you've seen before, but maybe not in the context of polymers. And um, this one image is um, showing you the, the usual stress strain curve for materials that you should all know and love. And um, of course, we know that okay, come on. We know that you know this area under the curve is, of course, the toughness, according to the textbook definition. And um, so that you know there is some value there, but no one are, no one ever quantifies toughness in this way. We use these. K1C measurements, which involve little bars with notches in them. You guys learned about that somewhere else besides from me. All right, for brittle materials, that's the standard for determining toughness, and that's where we worry about toughness the most. We don't worry so much about the toughness of rubber. We know it's very tough. Things that aren't very tough is what we need to measure a lot of. We don't do it this way. Um, but we do have a couple of things that we can discuss here from the standpoint of practicality. And uh, we first think about the modulus, or Young's modulus, as it says here. And when we um, measure this, which we do in the lab pretty frequently, you know, we, we look at the initial slope of this curve. You know, of course, the definition here is the initial ratio of applied normal stress and directional loading to the resultant normal strain. So we look at the slope, that's what that means. And typically, for a lot of the work we've done with polymer samples, we're looking at the slope at the very beginning of the measurement. So we take the first five to twenty data points off of our stress strain curve and say boom okay here's our here's our modulus for this material and so that's what's being shown here and that's, that's pretty part of it's pretty accurate and again that's the initial ratio of the response to an applied strain and then we think about the issue of a tensile strength all right and typically if we want something that is not going to deform then of course we're probably talking about up here someplace because beyond that it's deforming and so it's lost its strength. It hasn't broken but you know in terms of sense of strength for a, a structural component especially um, beyond that point the plane has already crashed as I like to say. And then uh, out here we have this issue of elongation of break and this is for polymers um, this is pretty informative unlike for inorganics <coughs> where usually it's not all that interesting. For polymers, we can learn things by looking at elongation and break. And so we can take a polymer specimen um, and either at this point or right after this point, put it in the SEM and say, what is going on here? Because we work with fibers, all right? And so what those fibers are doing and how we control the architecture of the fibers and what that did to cause a certain elongation to break to be reached, you know, those things are interesting to us. And then, as I said earlier, this um, area under the curve which is proportional to that, but no one uses it. Okay. So any questions about this? Hopefully this is all pretty straightforward. All right. And so when we think about the general behavior of polymers in this context, we have what we think of as tough and then brittle and then elastomeric plastics. And so these are the components of interest to us when we're describing these polymer structures. And we know we can engineer the polymer architecture to achieve these different goals, all right? And you should be very familiar with that. And so when we think about a brittle plastic, a stress strain linear up to fracture, about 1 to 2% elongation. Um, so question, we have what, what would you consider a component or a designed aspect of a brittle plastic? What kind of bonding is it going to have? What kind of secondary bonding? Let me rephrase the question. Very, um, very crystalline bonding? Uh, well, I'm sure it does not have a secondary bonding. No, that's, that's structure. That's microstructure. Yeah. Hydrogen? Hydrogen bonding. Okay. So you're likely to see a brittle plastic that is composed of hydrogen bonding. And as you can see here from this plot, that plastic with hydrogen bonding is going to have relatively little strain at certain values of stress. All right. And that's that's what we think of as being brittle. And then as we move on and we think about a tough plastic, all right, and so what kind of second, start with secondary bonding that might that, yes? Could you 
they're getting into like polar bonding with that? Yeah, I mean, polar hydrogen bonding, oh. kind of in the same category, yeah. All right. So, but if we start with a brittle plastic, with, which has, bless you, a lot of, of um, polar bonding or hydrogen bonding, all right, if we want to make something that's tougher, and so we don't want it to be super brittle, and again, we're talking pure polymers here, pure plastics, which hardly ever exist in nature, all right, as you all know. But um, if we want to engineer something, we can take that, formerly brittle plastic and maybe add in some polybutadiene or something into it. All right, we can make a cool polymer out of it. PVC, polybutadiene will give us something that is no longer as rigid, but is tougher and is able to undergo some type of deformation before it fails. All right, and this is all part of the mix and match of these types of structures. And so in that context, we're mixing in polar bonding and non-polar bonding or hydrogen bonding with something that doesn't hydrogen bond, at least not as easily as, um, bless you again, the, the uh, polar bonding in these plastics. Um, and then, of course, the elastomers. We know what elastomers are. They're examples of lightly cross-linked materials. Uh, they have the ability to, to snap back, and they have some strength. They, that's the difference between an elastomer and, say, the sap directly from a rubber plant. It just keeps, keeps extending and extending, or it, it may also behave like a liquid and just fail spontaneously. So we need to have some type of bonding in there. Um, and so high modules can be amorphous polymers with glass transitions greater than the test temperature. They could be semi-crystalline polymers with the amorphous portion who has a TG greater than the testing temperature. All right, so this relates to what temperatures are we using with these. If we go down to 0K, everything's a brittle plastic, okay? But when we get up to our temperatures um, above or below TG, depending on where we are, then that determines the mechanical properties of these pl particular plastics. And we'd like to think about uh, pure polystyrene with a TG of 100 as being an example of a, a plastic that has a TG well above room temperature, meaning that it's a brittle plastic. And it's, n again, pure state. So this pretty much review. All right, and so when we talk about tough plastics, we're looking at a yield point followed by some type of elastic deformation. And so after yielding, it shows extensive elongation until under an almost constant stress. We'll talk more about that here in a minute. And finally, the stress increases sharply with strain until rupture. And so we look at this curve. And uh, again, down here we have the modulus. We have this yield point, after which time structurally it's not particularly important to us, but maybe we're not using this in a structural application, so maybe we're good with that. And then out here at the end, we have the actual failure of this when everything breaks. Now you can see it starts to tail up in this context. All right, and um, we'll come back to this. But what's happening here is the polymer chains are aligning at the point of failure. All right, so we're getting some orientation and we're getting this resistance to the applied stress. All right, and so strain is going to be more difficult at that point. And so that's because as things start to narrow, then you get alignment before it actually does fail. Um, and we'll talk more about that here in a minute. Elastic modulus, of course, is, is going to be, as you see here, a certain value, but certainly less than a brittle plastic. Typically semi-crystalline. Um, and so for semi-crystalline polymers, as everyone knows, we have an amorphous, amorphous portion and a crystalline portion all together in the same given plastic. And the amorphous portion is usually in the tough rubbery state. All right, and this is how we can, another way of engineering it, where we bring in microstructure now and say we have crystalline components that are the rocks, higher modulus, but then the amorphous component is softer, the two together give us this tough behavior. So, and again, toughness can be measured with that area, but again, no one does it that way. So that should all be pretty clear. And uh, then we get into these different regions of this process. So we have this, this terminology called cold drawing. And again, it's um, one of those things that's a hangover from working with metallurgy. And um, it's not that there's any dislocations present in the system. We talk about cold drawing in metals. That's a very specific thing involving a lot of dislocations.
as is um, as this other term down here, strain hardening. Uh, both of those, um, classically speaking, involve dislocations acting together in concert in metals. But none of those are present here in these plastics. And so um, we have those, again, those four behaviors. Elastic in this area, the yield, which is there. And then we have the strain softening, which is the backside of that yield point, uh, where it goes back down, all right? So this region there that I'm going to multicolor, come on. This region is the strain softening, so it yields at the top point and it softens, all right, and becomes more easily deformed. That's what strain softening refers to in this context. And then the process of cold drawing is, let's see, out here. All right, and that's that constant stress region in which it gets longer and longer and longer. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute when it actually relates to a dog bone, which is what you guys are used to thinking about. So we need to go back and look at that again. And then at the very end of this, the strain hardening process is up here. Now, again, strain hardening in a metal is what we normally think about. Again, I don't like that word, that phrase, but it usually involves dislocations interacting and making life difficult. Here, we're talking about polymer change aligning and making further strain difficult. Okay. Any questions about that? Sort of a translation between metallurgy and polymers in this one plot. So you guys have seen these before, um, but the, the mechanisms that work when you look at a metal versus a ceramic versus a polymer are totally different in these contexts. Okay, so now we get into more of the meat of the lecture. So if we look at the stress strain curve and we're starting with a nice rectangular material. Um, I mentioned this before, you don't normally test rectangles, okay? You normally use dog bones because you get plain strain in dog bones. You're not going to get plain strain in a rectangle. It's not very, not very good plain strain. You might think about this as being a, uh, the neck region of a dog bone, which makes it less objectionable than just thinking about true rectangles. But if we just take out the, the neck region of the dog bone and say, okay, now we're looking at the strain of this material. This is the type of stress strain behavior we're going to see for that. And we know in that context that the elastic region is going to be stress proportional to strain. Deformation is completely reversible. You take the stress off and it snaps back to its original dimensions. All right, everything is good. So that's one of the definitions of what elastic materials are supposed to do is go right back to where they were. The gradient straight line section of the curve gives the elastic modulus, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so then now we're talking about where we go beyond that nice elastic fully reversible behavior and we get into this yield section. And what does yield mean in this context? And so as you've seen already in that German German titled English overdubbed video that you watched many times I hope, uh, this is what you see in that context when you strain very slowly. Okay, No crazing here, just a neck that forms and starts to extend. And so that's again happening here at this yield point where things start to heal over. All right, typically for polymers, and it depends a lot, 5 to 10% strain, local increase in cross-sectional area at a point along the stressing direction, the yield stress is the value at the end of the elastic region or at the top of the curve. And so, oops, you know, it depends on uh, convention. So some, some people say it's that, that top and some say it, it's just as it heals over and stops becoming a straight line. All right, so it depends on, on who you talk to. There's lots of debate about that. So that's all good. And then we get to the strain softening region. So we form the neck, and then we start to form what you guys should be familiar with, which is this, this region of decreased cross-sectional area. All right? And the, uh, the fact that it's undergoing softening all right, says that the stress falls after yield. That's where the phrase softening comes from. Okay, so it doesn't take as much stress 
to cause deformation. You had to work hard to get to this point, but then you don't have to work as hard beyond that point to make it extend. All right, and so in the neck region, extensive polymeric reorganization has taken place. And so, um, so if we think about this as the as injection molded dog bone neck area, we know out here it's going to be whatever injection molded microstructure we have. And so assuming we have a semi-crystalline plastic, which all crystalline plastics are semi-crystalline, uh, what might that look like? In the you know, cross-polar microscopy, what will we see? Is that semi-crystalline plastic? Or? Yeah, but they all are. So let's just say it's crystallized a lot. Let's leave it at that. So it's crystallized a bunch. So what do we what do we see? Spherulites, exactly. And those spherulites have um, again I'm saying it's highly crystallized. Those <coughs> spherulites have grown and run into each other, right? So we have this microstructure looking thing. No grains involved, but it looks like microstructure, and everything's everything's good because this was injection molded, allowed to cool relatively slowly. All right, so we get lots of crystallization in the middle here. Now what we've done though is we've drawn some of that microstructure into here. So what do we know? What, what does that now look like, that structure? I gave you guys a picture of it at one point. Yeah? You start having the fibril start expanding, or the chain start expanding, like slicing in half, right? Mm, chain starts slicing in half? You might be going. A little too, too, too far. Picture. I what picture you're talking about. Yeah, so we, we have the picture of the sphere lights, right? Yeah. And you take those sphere lights and you start straining it. All right. And so do the sphere lights disappear? No, they don't. Do the crystals suddenly become eliminated? No, they're still there. But you're starting to stretch it. Okay. Or maybe you're thinking of the clock diagram. Is yeah. That what yeah, okay. Yeah. You're thinking of the clock diagram, which is still active. Okay. And so that both of those pictures are accurate. And so you start to deform the crystalline structure, all right? And eventually, as you know from the clock diagram, you start breaking that crystalline structure, all right? But macroscopically, you know, initially, it's got to deform because you strained it, all right? It's gone from one dimension to a, a more narrow dimension, all right? And so you've taken that nice grain-like, sphere-like structure and distorted it into something that doesn't look grain-like anymore because it's all stretched out in one direction. And inside of all that, yeah, the clock diagram is operative. Does that make sense? Okay. So now we have here this strained microstructure. And uh, you know, again, think of the clock diagram. Okay, so two things to keep in mind when we start trying to describe that neck region. All right, and so as it says here, crystallites are, are broken up, or I think deformed is maybe a better word, and form an amorphous structure. Now that doesn't mean crystallinity goes away, but you get more amorphous content as you start to melt those crystals and pull the polymer chains out of those crystal structures. And then there's also, of course, there's going to be some orientation in the direction of stretch. Um, polymer chains are experiencing that. The crystals are experiencing that. The sphere lights are experiencing that. Everything is experiencing that. All right, depends on what level you're at. All right, any questions about that? That should all make sense to everyone at this point. All right, and then cold drawing, as it says here, involves the neck extension. Um, strain increases at all the constant stress. The polymer chains align themselves in a strain direction. Uh, what that really means, though, you know, if we're looking at, say, this was the the previous picture, all right, of this this neck region.
um, its structure may not be changing very much. What's happening is you're drawing in material and orienting it. All right, so this new stuff is undergoing the same reorientation. What's already there probably isn't changing very much. Okay, so what's happening is it's kind of picking on the, the easily deformed material and not straining this stuff in the middle of the neck that much. All right, so the clock diagram sees an advancement of the clock, you get to a certain structure, and then that structure is kind of set here in the middle, and then at the edges is where they're undergoing all this deformation, and achieving the same microstructure as what's already there in the middle. Does that make sense? Now this pulls a lot of stuff together, so hopefully it seems logical. Okay, and then this is where this terminology bugs me. Strain hardening. The stress rises until fracture occurs. There is strain hardening is in the consequence of chain orientation. Um, molecules align parallel to the stretching direction of the cold draw region of both amorphous and crystalline polymers. What does that really mean? So we have this, this distorted uh, spherical structure now exists all the way along the length of this region. And we can no longer draw in the stuff at the ends of the dog bones anymore. We've, we've, we've gone out to beyond the gauge length. And so now we have this region that's undergone this, this softening slash extension. And what we're doing is we continue to pull on it. All right. And of course, what that means up here is that we're starting to extend something that's already pretty extended. And so all of that alignment, all of that distortion of the crystals, the stretching of the polymer chains, the, the for deformation of the spherulites, now we're asking it, okay, do some more. And of course it doesn't want to do that because they already aligned things. And so all that alignment means it's more difficult to get more strain. And then as far as the clock diagram goes, the clock diagram ticks over to the region where you start really breaking up the polymer crystallites, the individual crystallites. And that's what's happening over here. All right, so amorphous content's decreasing obviously because we started to pull things out of the crystals. Does that all make sense? And so it is orientation. It's not just chain orientation though. It's microstructure orientation as well that makes that process more difficult beyond that point. Any questions about that? Okay. In contrast, we know elastomers are very different. Um, low elastic modulus, much less than brittle or tough plastics. We get high elongations. You can get several hundred to, you know, several thousand really. Depends on exactly what system you're working with. Percent. You can get huge elongations with some of these things. And so, in this context, um, it's an elastomer. Um, typically very amorphous, typically lower molecular weight. All right, chains can slide past each other relatively easily. There's not much in the way of crystallinity. They certainly don't have spherulites. All right, that doesn't even make any sense when you think about an elastomer, spherulites. There may be some small crystals in there, but you can't have extensive crystallinity. Otherwise, it won't behave like this. You do have the advantage of high toughness. So, of course, if you want to make a basketball, all right, elastomers are awesome for that. It could be an amorphous polymer with TG lower than test temperature, whatever it is, in the rubbery state. Rubber is SBR, styrene butadiene, cis poly polycis butadiene, and polycis isoprene. Um, one special case is a natural rubber, which is amorphous at room temperature and has a glass transition that is less than room temperature. Under tensile load strain can cause polymer chains to pack and form crystalline structures. This is called self-reinforcement. All right, that should make some sense. All right, you guys know enough now about crystal structure and kind of how fungible it is with, with plastics. You know, it can come, it can go. It, sometimes it shows up, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but polymer chain alignment is one of those things. You can get this, what is called this entropic cheat of polymer chain alignment. So we know polymers don't like to crystallize. We know there's an entropic barrier, but you take them and you line them up with strain. Oops, where'd that entropic barrier go? It went away, all right? Delta S is no longer a concern, and so you can get crystallization to occur, at least on a small scale, with some of these systems. Strain it further, and you might melt those crystals, but they can show up in the middle of the straining process. Okay, 
pretty weird stuff. All right, so getting down to some of the basics as far as properties, tensile strength of various plastics, polystyrene, PMMA, polyvinyl chloride, uh, polybisphenol carbonate. You have tensile strengths in 50 to 65 megapascal, elongation to break. Uh, for most of these, is relatively small. All right. And so with polystyrene, again, pure polystyrene, we know this is bulk. There's no hydrogen bonding in polystyrene, right? Well agreed, okay? Even though there's plenty of hydrogen, there's no hydrogen bonding. Polymethyl methacrylate, there is hydrogen bonding in polymethyl methacrylate. We have oxygen, all right? And so that's responsible for both the higher strength and the lower elongation to break with that particular material. Polyvinyl chloride, a ton of hydrogen bonding in polyvinyl chloride. Again, responsible for the tensile strength and the lower extension to break. Polybisphenol carbonate has both oxygen and bulk. All right, so as we know, that makes it a relatively strong plastic, okay? Um, has a, a decent elongation to break. All right, and then we start getting into what are called semi-crystalline plastics, which is a lot of what we work with every day, polyethylene, polypropylene, PTFE, uh, nylons, PET, we have strengths that are, are certainly lower, except for maybe the nylon case. And uh, we have elongations to break that are much, much higher. All right. And these should basically make some sense. Polyethylene, polypropylene, there's no hydrogen bonding there. All right. And so these chains can slide past each other. PTFE, um, there's actually no hydrogen bonding in PTFE either. Why? What? Yes. It's all fluorine. There's no hydrogen. You can't get hydrogen bonding without hydrogen. All right. Does that make sense? That was one of the test questions I was thinking about in this past test. But I said, eh, I don't give them that. All right. And so, but you can get lots of sliding. PTFE, that's, what, that's why PTFE is what it is. The chains slide past each other extremely easily. That's why we call it a low frictional material. They just slide right by each other. Um, Polyamide 66, uh, that's, we do have hydrogen bonding there, and PET, we also have hydrogen bonding. Uh, but still, relatively high elongations to break. And then we go to the opposite end of the spectrum with thermosets, and uh, we haven't really talked about these quite uh, much, but phenol formaldehyde is used to make your desks that you guys are leaning on. Epoxy resin, you can get that from the store, and then unsaturated epoxy resin. You know, there, the elongations to break are extremely small as a result of the fact that they're crosslinked. And all the things we just talked about with that dog bone cannot happen with a crosslinked material, right? We're all in agreement with that. That should be pretty obvious to you at this point. Okay, so let's look at these. Structural and environmental factors that affect mechanical properties. So how does molecular weight affect mechanical properties? Come back to this in a minute. Uh, increasing molecular weight uh, improves most mechanical properties. I remember that from what two weeks ago. It yeah, above low molecular weights, it definitely increases mechanical properties. So you go from floor wax, oligomers to something that's plastic, mechanical properties go up. All right, why is that though? I'm always asking why. Yes. Uh, it limits chain movement. The higher your molecular weight is. What was the first part of that? It limits chain movement. It limits chain movement. Yeah, right. So the higher molecular weights make it harder for chains to move. Um, primary reason for that? More entanglement. More entanglement, exactly. All right. So entanglements, remember I said they're sort of like crosslinks. They're not really crosslinks, but they kind of act like it sometimes. That makes it difficult for chains to move. That's one of the primary reasons we see that big bump. And then branching, it branches on a polymer. Does that make it harder to move or easier to move? All right, much harder to move. All right, so they have to not just slide past each other, but then they're sliding, and then suddenly a branch is there, and it bumps into the chain. Sliding stops. All right. Cross-linking, we should be really familiar with that. Crystallinity, uh, we take those polymer chains, and we lock them up inside a crystal structure. All right, and so the amorphous stuff out there can move, which is why semi-crystalline plastics are still useful to us. But those chains are still connected to those crystals, so ultimately, those crystals will restrain polymer chain movement. And so there's a big interplay there. 
And then, of course, the fact that we not only just plasticizers, we put tons of stuff into plastic. You guys are now fami very familiar with that. We put a lot of things into plastic, and a lot of them have the effect of increasing free volume, more free volume, more chain motion, changes mechanical properties. And then we just talked about the effects of polarity, secondary bonding, hydrogen bonding, that is. And then we've spent a lot of time talking about chain orientation already. Uh, remember the grocery bag, how it's different uh, mechanical properties in one direction versus another. And then, of course, uh, last but certainly not least, the rate of deformation. All right. Very high speeds, you don't give the chains time. Very low speeds, you give them lots of time. And as you saw from that video again, they can become like chewing gum if you go slow enough. Okay. So all those things should make sense to everyone here now. Any questions? All right. And then one thing I definitely want to talk about is, um, is fracture in these systems. And so I see this a lot on answers on tests. And so we, we talk about polymer chains. We talk about them sliding past each other. And we, we know that when we think about materials breaking in general, because we're trained by, we talk about ceramics, we talk about metals, uh, we talk about bonds breaking when these things fail. Um, and with polymers, it's a little more complicated because we have secondary bonding and we have primary covalent bonding. And the question people always want to know is, which one is breaking at the, at the very end? And the answer is, of course, as with polymers, it always depends. And so, uh, do we break covalent bonds? And so, um, an example I always give is because we're all familiar with it is balloons. So, the matter what balloons are made of? Well, some of them are still latex. Yeah. So they still use they they use rubber, like uh, rubber plant rubber. All right, and they mold it, and then they do what they call vulcanization, which is just light cross linking. Okay. So we, we blow up the balloon, all right, and then we blow it up enough and we pop it with a pin, all right. So you're taking that cross link structure and you're asking it to change very rapidly, all right. It goes from being this big thing to being just pieces on the floor. So in that context, rapid change, high strain rate, cross link structure, you are breaking covalent bonds, all right. Take that same balloon and put it on a load frame and strain it at, uh, one millimeter per year, all right, there's going to be a ton of polymers sliding past each other. In the very end, there's probably going to be some covalent bonds breaking, but I mean, if you take that and replace it with polyethylene with no covalent bonds, you will have no covalent bonds breaking at the end. The polymer chains, as is shown here, can just slide past one another, and eventually they slide to the point where the material is no longer connected to itself, all right? They just slide right by each other without any covalent bonds breaking. And so when you think about polymer fracture, it's in that spectrum. You know, if things go fast, then you might actually break covalent bonds. If things go slowly, the only thing you're breaking is secondary bond. And eventually it fails so much they just slide away, away from each other. Yes? So do you see this difference in like, say like a fracture surface? Of like yeah. Like okay. Oh, sure, yeah. So uh, we looked at lots of SEMs of uh, polymer samples. And if you strain slowly enough, you know, it's, Initially, it's a, a nice dog bone, and next, and next, and next, and in the SEM, you just see two cones pointing at each other in the very end. Everything just slides past everything else, and you're not breaking any covalent bonds. It just keeps sliding, and so it deforms like a liquid at the very end. Any other questions? All right, so keep that in mind when you're tempted to write about bonds breaking on the test. All right. This, these are the spectrum of things that can happen. Related chain interaction, strong in chain interaction, less relative chain motion, uh, more cross-linking, less relative chain motion, um, higher molecular weights, which means more entanglement, means less relative chain motion. Breaking covalent bonds needs higher force than chain chain motion. That's what it boils down to. So if you give it time, chain chain motion will always win. If you don't give it time or it's cross-linked, then you're going to have to probably end up breaking some covalent bonds. Okay. And so this is something that I think we saw this already, right? Tensile strength increases with an increase in molecular weight or due to the increased chain chain interactions. And this is just showing you this uh, number average molecular weight is 10 to the sixth. 
0.5, 1, and this is 0.1, we see he things heal over. And of course, that healing over process is due to entanglement. So things behave kind of like a liquid here, and then it gets to a point where it's relatively entangled, and this chain chain sliding process becomes much more inhibited. And suddenly we have a measurable elastic modulus, or we didn't really have one before. All right, so it stops behaving like a liquid and starts behaving like a solid due to entanglement. All right, and then of course tensile strength increases the branching due to the lower chain packing density and decreased chain interaction. Linear versus branch polyethylene is the one we always like to talk about. And then effects of cross-linking, you know, based on what we just talked about, you should be able to rationalize how very different the deformation of these three different states would be. All right, so this is capable of sliding out to infinity. These two are not, all right. This one, the higher cross-link density, is going to be a really brittle material. All right, this one here in the middle is going to be more brittle than that, but um, probably less brittle than the higher cross-link density. Okay, so just think about that elastic portion of the curve when you look at those two samples. What is the relative TG of these polymers? Um, and this kind of relates to back to the whole DMA thing. So uh, DMA is basically a way of measuring mechanical response to temperature, and you get a TG out of that, which is one of the reasons why we like DMA. It's a little more obvious when you had the glass transition. Are you asking for exact numbers or like a trend here? Just a trend. Um, linear would have lower, I believe, than low cross would have The lowest, lower lowest TG, yes. And then um, you have to be careful. So first off, you know, if I take these two plastics and um, assuming they're the same polymer chain structure, and I put them in the DTA or the DSC, I am likely to get the same TG when I measure these things. And that, the reason why that's likely is because these cross links are rare and few and far between. And so there's lots of unhindered chain out here that can behave just like the linear stuff, all right? This is, uh, again, especially true for elastomers. So maybe like draw a less than or equal to sign or something like that? Yeah, you could, yeah. But then out here, you know, the cross-link density becomes so high that, you know, there's a lot of restraint going on here, and here I'll uh, measure a higher TG. It takes more energy to get whatever's there to go through its glass transition because they're restrained by each other. All right. Now, that's the beauty of DMA. DMA is, you get a different number in the DMA for every one of these measurements. All right, because DMA is much more sensitive. Oh, so DMA, dynamic mechanical analysis, all right, and that involves this, this torsional treatment of the plastic. So it's, it's almost like a viscosity measurement as a function of temperature. You, you cause it to, to tort one way or the other. All right, and unsurprisingly, if TG is greater than test temperature, the polymer is in the glassy state, all right? And as you should know, sometimes that means it's literally glassy, you drop it on the floor, break glassy. Other times it just means it has a higher modulus, you drop it on the floor, it bounces. It's not really glass, very glassy, it's just a higher modulus. Okay? And then as we increase the crossing density, then of course that modulus is going to go up. Okay. If TG is less than the testing temperature, the polymer is in the rubbery state. As we increase the crossing density, um, even if the TG is, is that low, then we see this progressive increase as a function of stress and strain. Increased crossing density increases tensile strength. No, no surprise there. If crossing density is too high, the polymer loses, not losses, elasticity, and it becomes a brittle plastic. Um, now, I guess it's, it, there's a little bit of opinion here. Too high, what is, I mean, too high depends on what it is you're doing with it. If you're trying to make a, a structural part for an airplane, hey, you know, we want it to get higher. We want it to be able to bear load. All right. But there's the, the, the payment is in the, what happens to the properties um, 
in the in the transverse direction. So again, I, I told you guys about the plane example where they have these these um, F35s that are made with these fantastic polymer co composites made from things like polyamide, um, and they drop a wrench on it. All right, and because the wrench hits the polyamide, it fractures the polyamide matrix, and the guy starts flying around at Mach 5, and he sees black fuzz in his wing. All right, now that black fuzz is a polyamide or whatever it is flying out and leaving the the fibers behind. And that's because it's not that the composites didn't do its job. It does a great job in the direction of the wing. It's just the, the wrench hit it in the wrong direction. All right. And so it caused fracture of that really high strength matrix uh, because that really high strength matrix is also very brittle. So you hit it with a wrench or you hit it with a bullet, they have to replace that wing. All right. So it's, you know, th this too brittle, um, too soft is in the eye of the beholder. We know that TG increases the crothing density. Uh, again, TG can become greater than testing temperature, and we think of that as a thermostat that is now a rigid, a brittle, rigid, glassy material. All right, so it should make sense in terms of why crosslinking increases tensile strength. Fracture, uh, when it does occur, all right, requires crosslinks to break. This increases the net tensile strength. Increased crosslink density requires more crosslinks break. And so, you know, all this chain slippage stuff, if you start putting crosslinks in there, then a lot of that becomes impossible, all right, because the presence of crosslinks are going to be there and it restrains that process. And so you can have this process of taking a, a um, thermostat matrix and causing it to break, meaning that, you know, this thing is fractured along a line next to what used to be a component of itself. All right, and it should make sense, and this is kind of a yin and yang thing, cross-linking decreases permanent deformation. Uh, permanent deformation is kind of a big deal with plastics because it tells us things about the structure. If we take our polymer sample and we strain it, all right, and what happens is you take all that, that strain off and what's left behind is a certain amount of permanent deformation, a difference in the length of that material. And if it's highly cross-linked, this is going to drop down to zero. It's going to behave like a brittle solid. It goes straight up and straight down. Straight enough, eventually it breaks, but the permanent deformation is always going to be zero with a highly cross-linked material. So permanent deformation can occur when chain slippage is allowed. Cross-linking eliminates this or decreases it. In many engineering applications, permanent deformation is not desired, one of the best ways to minimize that is to cross-link the polymer, which is what we do with rubbers in many cases. I mean, you can't just take the rubber tree, get the sap, form it in a tire, and drive around on the road. We have to cross-link the heck out of that with sulfur, as all our good friends Goodyear did way back when. All right, and this increases the tensile strength and decreases the permanent deformation more or less. Are you guys familiar with the hot weather effect with cars? Um, if you park a car in the middle of July out on the street and you wait about a week, maybe less, and you start to drive the car, there's a little feeling like you just drove over a hill, a very small hill. Am I the only one who notices this? All right, your tires deform sitting around in all that heat. All right, so they start to, they don't flatten out, but they, they start to assume the shape of the contact with the road. All right, and then you, you force it to drive and you're deforming that little hump that, that's, that's built up over time sitting there in the road. Okay, so if you ever notice that, you comment on it. You get it during the winter too. Yeah, it does. It's a little different because there it's. Uh, oh, because my tires are moving a little flat. Oh well, okay, you're cheating. <laughs> 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 yeah, so there you're deforming it because it's it's hardened up in the winter. Yeah, that's a different you situation. Replace the tires after that. Replace them? No, no, they're fine. No, yeah, they just it just deforms that plastic back to where it should be. So you're not breaking anything, you're just deforming it. So you're giving it a lot of time and it's slowly creeped into the new configuration. All right. Even if it's a cross length, it'll still respond to creep. All right. Uh, but then you, you roll over it and it pushes it back to its normal conformation. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and then things that should make sense to us by now. Polar groups increase the chain interactions, increase tensile strength. PVC is harder than polyethylene. Um, nylon is harder than polyethylene. That involves some of the main chain aspects of that, which 
has, means that the nylons are in the main chain. And rigidity of the polymer chain, you guys know about the effects of these big bulky groups now, along with the fact that we get hydrogen bonding. Tensile strength increases the crystallinity, packing density, uh, chain interactions, uh, basically reinforcing it. If you look at a semi-crystalline polymer, it's you know amorphous plus crystalline rocks reinforcing the softer phase. All that should make sense in terms of this increase of uh, modulus versus crystallinity. And then I should say, you know, plasticizers and everything else. <laughs> So we have plasticizers, we have flame retardants, we have lubricants, we have all kinds of things in plastics. Um, and they all behave pretty much the same way. Low mass additives, spread the chains apart, increase free volume, act as sort of a molecular lubricant to mediate chain chain polar interactions, usually decreasing it. And the example we've talked about already is uh, bis 2 ethylhexyl phthalate to neat PVC can lower the blends TG. PVC is 70, DOP itself is minus 80, and we can use rule of mixtures to describe that new glass transition for that particular blend of polymer and plasticizer. And then what's going on here, of course, and this is, again, relates to the structure, PVC, we know that's lot, got lots of hydrogen bonding, all right? If we, if we just try to, let's see, take this portion and mix it in with PVC, they would probably phase separate, all right? Like dissolves like, all right, this portion over there is there's no polarity to it, so they're likely to phase separate. So what we do is we have this component, which has the ability to hydrogen bond and gets it to blend into the PVC, associates with the chains. These guys sit out there and wave around and keep the polymer chains from getting close to each other. All right, and that's that's the function of plasticization. Okay, and so what you see as a net result. You have pure PVC, which you pretty much never ever come across, all right? We should all realize that by now. When we add plasticizer to it, it behaves more like a ductile material, all right? And we talked about how important this is in the winter for PVC in terms of its behavior and its brittleness. And the production of polymer films orientation needs to be accounted for. And um, yeah, I wish we, could, um, wish we could orient both materials, all right? the world would be different if plastics could easily be bulk and oriented at the same time. But as you saw, for the plastic grocery bags, they're very thin, all right? And plastic sheeting, if you ever come across that, if it's oriented, it's also very thin. So this is something that we can get with thin materials because we can stretch them quite a bit, especially in the molten state. Try to do the same thing with a bulk material and, you know, there's, there's too much volume there. It's really hard to orient it. But we can make polymer films that are oriented and have very different properties. Increased tensile strength in that direction, um, sometimes called the machine direction, if you ever come across this. And that's because the machine is aligning it in that direction, so they call that the machine direction. And you get that orientation. Much greater chain chain friction and the need to break covalent bonds to ultimately fracture that polymer chain. In contrast, unoriented polymer can fail by both chain chain motion and the fracture of the covalent bonds. Uh, chain slippage requires much less stress to fracture. So we have higher tensile strength as a result of orientation, all right, and if you pull on it hard enough, you know, you may end up fracturing the covalent bonds, uh, assuming you use the right rate. Any questions about that? Right. Okay, and then of course, as you, everyone should know by now, thoroughly, by heart, the effects of rate on the behavior of these materials. And that translates into local scale polymer chain motion. And if you don't give it time for local chain polymer chain motion, then you know it's going to behave like a brittle material. Give it plenty of time, it's going to behave like chewing gum. All right, so we're all familiar with this now. It's kind of review, kind of different. Any questions about this? All right, so we have class on Monday? Yeah. <laughs> yes, we do. Yes. Not on Wednesday, though. Not on Wednesday. I'm not the only one in the university doing this, all right? <laughs> Are you going to see me? <laughs>
Uh, yeah, but if everyone jumped off the bridge, would you too? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah, it's an awfully good point. I do that. <laughs> Don't show I up. know, but it makes me feel like I should come to class. <laughs> <laughs> when you like, are here teaching. Like, you feel guilty about the fact that I'm standing here lecturing to an empty room? I'm myself here in the cold. Really, I can just sit at my desk, watch a lecture. You can. I'm not stopping you. I don't think you'll hurt his feelings. Yeah, that's right. I'll, I'll, I'll make a red check mark next to your name. <laughs>